twisted glee. A horror host like you've never seen. He'll take you on a ride of fear and sadness. Dr. Acid's Midnight Madness. The face from this movie, the singer's face, the wavering eyes, the giant killer shrew. So quiet out there. Take a slant up that trail. Strange setup, wouldn't you say? I'm Dr. Craig. Thorn Sherman. I have a passenger for you. Captain Sherman, this is my daughter, Anne Craig. Oh, so you're the passenger. That's right. Well, it's going to be nice having you aboard. But we're not leaving today. I heard a knock on a door, and I believe that is the mailman. Captain, yeah. Mr. Fell, Jerry Fell. Father, Matt. Mario. Si, sí, senor. Excuse me. I think I'll change. Meet Captain Thorne Shem, Radford thing. How do you do? Two new litters since lunch, Doctor. Both support GT-116. What is that? It's a Sorex sericity. Looks like a small rat. How big do they get? That's a nettle. The muscle's longer than rats. See? Does he bite? Only when he's hungry. Here's something that you saw from the Philips. Can you guess what it is? Like cannibals. When the flesh is gone, they'll eat the bones from marrow. I'm gonna complete these experiments with your father, regardless of anything. Get out! Somebody! Get out! Get out! What's in the box? Well, please, that's box. Good to see about this. All right. Uh, okay, so what do we got? We got Linda Lindhorst. Sounds like a porn name. But Linda Lindhorst thinks it's a witch cat. Is oh, it a witch cat? A witch cat. All right. <laughs> Mike what? Sedona thinks it's a half a puppy. Mike Sedona says half a puppy. There's a Tom Murphy out there. Tom Murphy. He thinks it's a rock. Rock. Linda Lovelace also said, is it Scott Newton's left hand? Linda Love says it's who? Scott Newton's left hand. Oh, I know Scott (laughs) Newton. Scott (laughs) Newton's left hand. All right. Uh, Mike Sedona piped in with, is it 13 nipples? Oh, he's going for two guesses. 13 nipples. I think he really wants that, uh... That death furry? He's a fat What? I'm just kidding. It's a foam ash for some people. A little fat smirk. All right, uh, what else we got? Hmm, we've got Tom Murphy again. Pointing out it's a dead puppy. A dead puppy? <laughs> All right. Sam Gaffin says, Oh no. Sam Gaffin wants to know if it. Okay, does it taste watered down? Does it taste watered down? Yes. Okay. I'm going to say yes. Taste? That's from the movie. Mm-hmm. We're looking at Sam. Down. All right. What else we got? What's in the box? It's about. Five inches long. I'm going to say it's 13 line. nipples. 13 nipples? Shake it again. All right, who else we got? That's pretty much it. Uh, check the other feed. Check the other feed. Computer, <laughs> number one. Uh, we got witch cat, cat puppy, 13 nipples. We got Uzi. Uh, she thinks it's last night's dinner. Oh, there. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, what did Daddy say? Is it a credit card? That's a good guess. Credit card. All right. We have Tim. 
Jim? Who wants to know if it's a midget's penis? Wow. Wow. I'm going to abbreviate that. <laughs> it is me, Ben. And abbreviate that to this bit. Uh, anything uh, else? We've got my balance, huh? Oh, wow. Okay. She says probably when I get a chance. She doesn't care what's in the box. <laughs> okay. We've got a lot of guesses. Go back to the movie. We get back on break. I'll open the box. See what it is. And see who won. See who won the uh, dead death Kirby or the bone ash and eaten dead chainsaw. Let's go back to the movie. In 2018, a group of scientists discovered a new species of shrew in Indonesia and named it after the movie. The species is called Crossadura Kologi, after Ray Kellogg, the director of The Killer Shrews. The movie's co-producer, Ken Curtis, was also an actor known for his role as Festus in the TV series Gunsmoke. The shrew's costumes were made by gluing synthetic fur onto wire frames shaped like shrew bodies. <laughs> Stay. You know, if one of those trees crashes through, it might just Look, not honey, go any tree on this side of the house will fall away from it, so just relax. But I think I'd better go back aboard. If I don't think I'm not grateful for your hospitality, I am. I'll see you tomorrow. Thorn, your ship is safe. Please, stay here with me. Why? You scared or lonesome? Both. I'll take a rain check on it. Thorn, you can't leave. No one opens that gate after dark. Well, who's going to stop me? You? Well, this. No one opens that gate at night. Now, look, I don't ask questions because it's against my principles. Wouldn't you like to explain that? All right. Sit down and I will. Give me the gun. Not very becoming, anyway. Do you believe in fairy tales? Well, I'm a little old for that sort of thing, but uh, what'd you have in mind? Well, I'll tell you about one. A true fairy tale. And you're right in the middle of it. Oh? Have you ever heard of a shrew? As in taming no, of the... No, the animal. Brad would call them sorts or easy when he showed you one. Oh, then shrew must be the common name for those cute little animals. Cute? That's the last word you can use to describe those little monsters. They're the most horrible animals on the face of the earth. As father told you, they breed within three weeks after birth. Their life span yeah, is yeah, I know what year. your father told me, but what's that got to do with me opening that gate? There are two or three hundred giant shrews out there. Monsters weighing between 50 and 100 pounds. 50 to 100? Wait a minute, you must be kidding. I'm definitely not kidding. That's as big as a full-grown wolf. And what's more, they are beginning to starve. No wonder you didn't want me to go out there. Thanks for saving my skin. Well, I'm sorry I had to threaten you with a gun. But I didn't know how else to stop you. Oh, well, it was very effective. But all you had to do was tell me about them. Well, I hoped I wouldn't have to. But you changed everything when you started to leave. And I had to stop you some way. You say there's two or three hundred out there? Man. That's right, Captain Thorne. And if you'd stuck with your rowboat and played captain instead of trying to play detective, you wouldn't have to worry about how many are out there, would you? That's enough, Jerry. What's wrong, Ann? Thorne decided to leave. To dissuade him, I started to tell him about the shoes. You might as well know the whole story, as half of it. I guess you're all a little jumpy, Captain. Yeah, I'm sorry. Six months ago, we managed to isolate the pack to control in size. Two litters were born. Six individuals we kept for study. 
were about the size of buckshot at birth. But their rate of growth was abnormal. They continued to grow. They were mutants. But they inherited all the negative characteristics of their breed. Somehow they managed to escape. <laughs> But a month later, we saw one of the offspring. They were multiplying. We did everything in the world to exterminate them, but no apparent luck. Then we haven't seen any. Since daylight neither blinds them and they, they forage only at night when they're starving. But the fact that two of them charged Anne and Jerry at the gate last evening indicates that the available food on the island is nearing depletion. Then what, Doctor? They will exterminate each other. It'll take a couple of days. And what do we do during that time? Stay indoors and wait until it's over. I'm get some wires blew down on the transformer. I'm sorry. I'll get some lamps. Mario! Mario! Si, senor. There's a lantern in the pantry. Light it and bring it in here. Bradford, light all the candles you can find. All right, I will. Where's the generator? Outside. Can't get at it at night. Here, let me help you. The lantern will give you all the light you need. I will join you shortly, Jerry. She was sincere and made sense from her standpoint. Wanting her father to leave the island with her makes sense? <laughs> It'd be much better for the project if I went with her for a few days. Matter of fact, I think I'll talk to the doctor about that. That might be the answer. And another thing, I don't take much to this Thorn Sherman. He looks to me like the type that'd try anything. That left-handed dinner invitation. That was just to keep me here till after dark, wasn't it? I wanted you here tonight. I thought something terrible was going to happen. Well, you still feel the same way about it? Not as much. Not since you're here and know everything. <laughs> Love an open fire, don't you? Mm -hmm. The wind has a lonesome sound, doesn't it? Sure does. Like in Sweden, we don't have a wind this strong. Now we're going to vote the presence of a poltergeist. I've used three methods in the past, and each have yielded great results. One of them is the invocation of Bloody Mary. The second one is reading aloud some verses from the Necronomicon and the Cthulhu Lexicon. And three, using a Ouija board to invite the presence of a spirit into your house. If the horror genre is defined by its capacity to petrify, then Toby Hooper's 1974 The Texas Chainsaw Massacre reigns supreme. In a harrowing 83 minutes, Hooper unapologetically drags the audience into a surreal, visceral nightmare. The film hinges on the purest form of fears and the unknown, embodied by the monstrous enigmatic figure of Leatherface. The story centers around a group of unsuspecting friends who fall prey to a family of deranged cannibals, most notably the chainsaw-wielding Leatherface. The grainy 16mm film it's shot on enhances the eerie realistic terror, making it feel like a dreadful documentary. What truly sets it apart, though, is the relentless tension and nihilistic dread that permeates every frame. A genre-defining film, it's a paradox of minimalistic plot yet maximalistic horror. 
the raw, almost documentary-like approach to violence in the eerily silent stretches interrupted by sudden eruptions of brutality deeply unsettled viewers. Whilst not for the faint-hearted, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is an unforgettable cinematic experience embodying the essence of pure horror. It's a stark reminder of the genre's potential to tap into primal fears, leaving viewers with a lingering sense of discomfort long after the screen goes dark. A masterpiece of its time that continues to influence filmmakers to this day. I'll leave you with this frame from the movie which I consider to be the most horrific and iconic image in the entire history of cinematic horror. To me, this image represents everything I love about horror. I ask myself whenever I see this picture, did director Toby Hooper plan this shot to be iconic during the shoot, or did it happen to become iconic after the film was released? Okay, dog. Alrighty. What do we have? Let's take a look. <laughs> take a look what's in the box. Let me tell you, they 14 nipples. 14 nipples. Okay, we gotta remember. Oh! There's a note. Note says, this is a century egg from the Philippines. It's a hundred years old. Enjoy. Egg. Wow. What's it taste like? A century egg, a hundred years old. Oh, you may want to come take a close up look at this. <laughs> All of the fetus? Oh my goodness. A century egg. It says it's a century egg. Let's see if I can open it up. Oh my goodness. <laughs> a century egg. Oh my god. Ha <laughs> ha! Scramble it. Oh my goodness. It's black. Oh my goodness gracious. Away. Wow. Wow. Put it in your mouth. Are you a man? Yes. Well, hey, you do it. I would do it, but I don't have a mouth. Oh my god. It's Aha! Uh -huh. Holy cow! I want to smell your fingers now. <laughs> oh my god! It tastes like. Oh my god! I get grandma. Wow! Oh my god! It tastes like um. The worst and none I ever hooked up with. Oh wow, it's unexplainable. The second worst one I've ever I don't know if you can see that. Does it taste like Giga Butt? Wow, it tastes kind of like an egg, like but. The Snickers has cancer? Like an egg that's been crossed with bad mint? It's kind God. of bad. Oh God. Oh, wow. All right. I thought you wish it was 13 nipples, huh? <laughs> oh, all right. Let's see who wins. Who was the closest? Who got the closest? God, that's terrible. A hundred year old egg. Let's see. Witch cat. A half a puppy, 13 nipples. Rock. A dead puppy. That's the Tom. Scott's left hand. Taste watered down. Dinner. <laughs> Credit card, admitted pen. <laughs> All, the, All right, who? The peanut gallery in the back. What do you think? So who do you think? I well, Paul was the closest one. Well, I'm, I'm gonna say Paul the owl. <laughs> I think the closest thing is rock. Like Charlie Brown's rock? I mean, it is a rock. Yeah. Um, 
All right, that's Mr. Tom Murphy. So, Tom, which piece of crap gift do you want? The foamy thing? Or the death Furby? Or the Smurf? I don't know. The drinking you, problem. Can you catch this? Ah ha ha! That's being said with you. All right, what would you like, Tom? We've got some foam. Ask for some the Evil Dead. Or the Death Furby. Let us know. Let's proceed, Tom. C. All right. Let's wrap this up, put it in a box, <laughs> and let's go to the movie. The movie's island setting was actually a ranch in Texas, and the interior shots were filmed in a studio in Hollywood. The original script included a subplot about a romance between two of the characters, but it was cut from the final version. The movie's musical score was composed by Harry Bluestone and Emil Katkin, who also wrote music for many other B-movies at the time. You're a strange man, Thorn. I never met anyone like you. Oh? You seem so disinterested in everything. Aren't you the least bit curious? Don't you wonder about the unusual things around here? The guns, the fins, the shattered windows, my accent, anything? I'll tell you something. I'm only interested in anything that concerns me, then I do something about it. <laughs> You're gonna sail with me tomorrow, whether your father intends to me. those doors no I put them in the barn myself I couldn't get through the wood doors they dug through the dirt floor let me ask you something doctor how could you expose all our lives yourself included with those things out there all you had to do was get the Coast Guard or the Navy to come in here and burn them out those things got loose any unusual experiment can produce unusual results that's why I chose this island. It's isolated. Miles of open water in any direction. Our project is privately financed. It's not a problem for the government or military. The world is in no danger. His species does not swim. And as far as the shrews are concerned, this island is their world. Very soon, Right here on this island is going to be a miniature reproduction of an overpopulated world. And you'll see the importance of what we're working to avoid. I'm not concerned about all this theory. What I'm concerned about is our lives. There'll be ample time to panic when they run out of food and go on a 24-hour forage. How do you know they haven't already? That's possible. Their main diet has been the small animals on the island. That source could have been depleted 18 or 20 hours ago. That's why they went after the livestock. There's still some food on this island before they reach the crisis. Where? <laughs> no worry about them digging in here. <laughs> the floors are tiled. But the walls aren't, Doctor. They're adobe. Our safest bet would be on that boat. You may be right. You can reach your boat in daylight. The shrews will gorge themselves on livestock. That should keep them lethargy for several hours. There's no sense looking at the dark side. And there's no sense minimizing a serious situation. It leaves you completely unprepared to cope with it. 
Well, we certainly can't make it tonight. That's out of the question. Maybe tomorrow. I haven't. We'll get some sleep tonight. But we'll have a watch, an hour and a half apiece. Doctor, you go first, and then Radford. Mario, Jerry, and then me. Shutter all the windows. Make sure they're locked good and tight. Check all these walls. Come on. No, I think I'll stay here by the fire. I feel safer. I couldn't stand it in that room alone. All right, as you wish. But try to get some sleep. Farrell, here is Mario. You are next to make the patrol, no? Uh, sure, Mario. Come on in. I've been, been waiting for you to finish. I must have dozed off. You kind of startled me. Sit down. Here. Have a drink. It will help you to relax. Gracias, señor. Sit down. That's the while. You just checked every room in the house, didn't you? See. Si. Why? You're a good man, Mario. A man that can be trusted. <laughs> Imagine a intelligent girl like her going for a common sea tramp like him. I know why. You do too. In case anything goes wrong, she's looking out for her own hide. That's why I keep thinking about you and me. Anything goes wrong... We're going to outlast them all. I'm going to trust you to take my turn at patrolling the house. But when you finish, don't wake the captain. Come back here and get me. Yeah, I'll probably feel good enough by then to take his turn. Okay, Mariam? See. Si. Okay. Now, the Necronomicon, or the Book of the Practices of the Dead, was a book that was featured in many of the fictitious works of H.P. Lovecraft. Now, if you read certain verses of the Necronomicon, it would open up a portal or doorway to an inner dimension where these monstrous, huge creatures slept the size of planets called the Old Ones. If a doorway was open and humans were not ready for the Old Ones to come through and rule the Earth, then the Old Ones would continue to sleep, but something would pass through the doorway to our dimension that madness would abound amongst the humans. Now the great thing about the Necronomicon and the Cthulhu Mythos is you merely had to recite the verses aloud and have it in its printed form in order for a doorway to open. So, click on verse 1 and verse 2 while the text is on screen. And then let's continue.
<laughs> wow. I am completely amazed that you made it through that movie. That was completely nightmarish. It was horrific. How many people died? I don't know. But congratulations for making it. All right. Join us tomorrow night. And with that, I will see you next time. Good night.